Assalamualaikum and welcome to the video. My name is Muhammad Asfa Iqmal bin Farid and my partner for this presentation is Amiru Faizi bin Basri. I will be telling you about the ISD, the ISD model, instructional design model titled Dick and Carry model. This instructional design model was created by Walter Dick and Lou Carey in 1978, hence the name Dick and Carey model. This model is also known as system approach model where it involves nine step process for planning and designing. The nine steps also includes all of the ADDIE model five stages but give further depth and structure than the ADDIE model because the dig and carry model focuses more in the interdependence among the elements in designing process. Now let's look at what are the nine steps in dig and carry model that was created by both of them. The first one is identify the instructional goal. The second one is conduct instructional analysis. Third, identify entry behavior. The fourth, performance objective. Fifth, develop criterion test. Number six, develop instructional strategies. Number seven, develop and select instructional materials. Eight, develop and conduct formative evaluation. And lastly, the ninth step is develop and conduct summative evaluation. I know that I said there's nine step in dig and carry model, but the tenth step is basically ongoing revision. We will look at that later. Now let's look at each of the steps, but this time in deeper detail. Okay, the first one we have identify the instructional goals. Basically, identify the instructional goal is what are the skill, knowledge, and or attitude that a learner will be expect to acquire. So, in this first step, you need to know what is needed. For example, the skill, knowledge, or attitude that you or your team required to reach the goal. Second, conduct instructional analysis. The instructional analysis determines the current state of skills and knowledge that you and your team have. Through this, you know how much gap you had to get to your goals. This can be assessed through interview, surveys, observation or different form of testing depending on the nature of the skills. The third step is identify entry behavior. In this step, you need to know what are the general characteristics of the learners, which is your team, including prior knowledge and skills need to meet the objective. You also need to understand their behaviors, trait, level of motivation, and other factors that will affect the learning journey. This information will help you design appropriate learning method according to your goals. The first step is performance objective. Basically, you write down an objective for the learner consists of three parts, the behavior, the condition, and the degree. Objective must be measurable in order to accurately assess the performance. The learning objective should be smart and should lay out everything that must be mastered and how they will be assessed. This may be known as the term SWBAT in education, which means student will be able to do. So in this performance objective, you need to lay out what is your goals, what basically your objective and what is needed to be done in order to achieve those objectives. 
The fifth step is develop criterion test. As the name say, it's a, it is a test and this test is needed to monitor both progress and effectiveness of the instruction. You need to develop criterion specific tests. Basically, it's a specific test that needs to be met with the criteria that you need in the objective. This should be of the right format and level for your learning level. Learning level is basically uh, the age or for example, uh, we are in a university level right now. So our learning level should be degree level. The type of test could be and not limited to pre-test, which is a test before the learning, post-test, test after the learning, and practice item in between the learning session. 6. Develop instructional strategies. After you know what your goals, current state gap, objective and testing approach are, you should define your instructional strategy. It should reflect your analysis such as pre-instruction activities, content presentation, participation and assessment. You should also use appropriate learning theories. So in this step, you need everything that can be done hands-on by the student or basically your team. And you need to use every tools and learning theories that may help you in this learning process. The seventh step of this model is develop and select instructional material. Materials such as tools, exercise, and delivery media should be decided once you have defined your learning strategy. This may include face-to-face, group-based, facilitated, or online learning materials. Number eight, develop and conduct formative evaluation. Formative evaluation involves assessing how effectively you have formulated your learning initiative. This can be obtained through review, focus group, testing of segments, and piloting your learning program. Feedback of team should be used to iterate the initiative. From the feedback that you have received uh, after the test, you should know what needs to be uh, repaired, what needs to be put uh, more attention to it and the ninth step is develop and conduct summative evaluation summative evaluation takes place once you have delivered your initiative and is used to assess how effective it has been are your participants satisfied with the program have knowledge and skill increased because of it has the business noticed any benefit due to it so basically, this is where you ask feedback from uh, your learners or your teammates about how effective have uh, your strategies and everything that you have done so far to achieve the goal and give benefits to them. So uh, in this step, you can reevaluate what should have been done, what is uh, what works for them, and with that. We are on to the last step with this ongoing revision. You should continually review and revise throughout your instructional design and development process, regularly seeking feedback, testing outcomes, and iterating through stages of your learning products will help you ensure you deliver the best possible outcomes. So at the 10 steps, Basically, it is not included in the 9th step model, but not the 10th step is basically you go all over again, review everything, and basically just make sure how you can make the progress or your work better and better for the future. And that's it for uh, Dick and Carrie instructional design model. And I will be uh, giving you uh, 
the explanation on Higgs law from my partner Amirul, Amirul Faizi Ben Basri. Thank you. Assalamualaikum and hi, my name is Amirul Faizi and in this video, I'm going to talk about Higgs law. So, before I go further in detail about how it is applied into a web design, I'm going to tell a little bit about the history of it and what Higgs law basically is. So, Higgs law, what is it? Hmm. Okay, let me tell you. Higgs law or the Higgs Hyman law is named after a British psychologist and an American psychologist, which are William Edmund Higgs and Ray Hyman. So, back in the days in 1952, these two geniuses set out to examine the relationship between the number of stimuli that occur and the reaction time of an individual to any stimulus given. And yes, as expected, when the number of stimuli to choose from increases, the longer it takes for the user to make a decision. Users that got too many choices have to take time in order to interpret and make a decision which leads to something that they surely don't want. Like, it's like you know, all you want to do at that time was to buy a book. But uh, for example, Harry Potter book, I mean novel but you end up needing to scroll down and come across children's books, magazine, comics, etc. So from here, you know that you just did something that you don't want to, which is scrolling across all of the books that you are not looking for. So it's like, you're just wasting your time doing those. So easily speaking, the application of Higgs law is simple. Just reduce the number of stimuli and you will end up getting a faster decision-making process. But there are exceptions to this rule. For instance, the user might already have something in their mind before they come across the, simu uh, the stimuli. So the, the time for the users is likely to be less compared to those who have not yet had something in their mind before seeing the stimuli. So that's basically it. And now we will go on to the implementation of Higgs law. Okay, believe it or not, Higgs law is not just applied in a web design. It is actually applied everywhere, like serious. Okay, just so as some of your appliances, uh, for example, microwave, or if you don't have microwave, you can also look at your washing machine. Look at the buttons. It surely has Higgs law in it. Okay, now I'm gonna show you two pictures of microwave. I know this is random, but let's look at it. So, which one of them do you think is applying Higgs law? First, the one with lots of buttons, and the other one with just two knobs on it. Yes, you guessed it right. The second one is applying Higgs law. Because why? Because it is way simpler and saves you more time. Just turn the knob and voila, your food is ready. Okay, if that's about the application of Higgs law in everyday life, what about the application of it in web design? Here, look at the menu on top of the BBC News website. That is basically Higgs law that is applied in web design because it comes up with an organized navigation and functions for the users to save their time when visiting. So as from the example that I have given just now, we know that simplicity is the key, but is it okay to use Higgs law on its own when designing a web? Hmm. Of course not, because to make it work effectively, you need to combine Higgs law with other design principles. I'm going to emphasize. Uh, I'm going to emphasize this. Okay, simplicity is often more. Yes, it is true, but sometimes you cannot avoid complexities. For example, the SLR camera. We know that there are so many options and controls to choose from. I can say, yeah. It is very complex when it comes to the SLR, but people still use this uh, the SLR to capture high quality pictures. Am I right? So why don't photographers use smartphones only? It also has cameras, right? But here's the thing: the objective of Higgs law is to simplify the decision making process, but that doesn't mean it is applied to eliminate the entire process. So if in web design, we often have so many choices, so many things, so many functions to show to the users, but that doesn't mean you need to throw away most of them just to make your website look simple, right? 
So we need to think on how to introduce them to the users. This is why you need Higgs law and other principles. But right now, I'm not doing other principles, right? So let's just focus on Higgs law. Okay, we will go on how to effectively employ Higgs law when designing a website. Okay, first and foremost, categorizing choice. I can say almost all websites nowadays apply Higgs law in their navigation. You don't want everything to be on your screen all at one time and make you end up spending hours to scroll through a menu, right? So thank God that we have Higgs law applied where designers categorizing choices into main navigation and sub navigation, which helps the users to quickly find the thing they need based on each category. I have shown you previously about the BBC, uh, BBC News menu, right? So that is one of the example of categorizing choice. And this is another one, shopping. Here you can see the categorization of products that they sell. Okay, th this shop sells anime stuff. So let's say if I want a figurine from the anime Ray Zero, I'll just go here and click it. They will provide all of the figurines for the characters in the anime. If I want to go for the next one, which is Konosuba, I'll just click it here and they will just provide figurines of the characters from Konosuba. As you can see, everything is in category. So that is all about it. Make sure everything is categorized in order to reduce time for the users when visiting your website. Keep in mind, users' times are precious. Now, moving on to the next one. Now, we are going to talk about obscuring complexity or I can say engagement. Engagement with who? With the users. Try to be a user-friendly website as much as you can. You can do it by reducing the complexities and being simple with the web design. Okay, let me clarify things up. Users, they don't like to face tough decisions or to spend plenty of time getting through things like registration or logins. So they want to get to the content they're looking for as quickly as possible. I'm sorry, but I have to say this. It is regarding the student portal website that we have. You know, it keeps on telling me to log in this, logging that before I managed to evaluate a subject on iLearn. Okay, look at this. I already log in or registered once, then once again, I need to do the same thing. You don't want to design your website like this. It is time consuming indeed. So just register once and you're good to go. No need to be complex. But if you need to ask for more information, you can do it in a small chunk. Okay, that is all about it. Now I want to tell you about things that might be useful for Hex Law application. Okay, Hex Law is powerful, but doesn't apply in every situation. As a web designer, you can exploit these facts to your advantage. First and foremost, group menu items together. You can use meaningful headings like product categories. For example, turn one massive choice into lots of smaller ones, like this. From here, decision times will be shorter. Next, consider contrast. It can be done by contrasting color, shape, size, and texture. From here, you can indicate choices more clearly, like this. So with this, you can then apply it to your web design and try to help reduce your user's time decision process. Now, we will move to the next one after you have launched your website. Okay, after your website has been launched, keep your eyes on these two, which are time on sites and page views. Time on sites, you need to make sure the users that visit your website didn't spend too little time and didn't spend too much time. Just make it enough time. If it's too little time, they are likely not understanding or confused with the option given and too much time might also be due to the same outcome. So making it just nice is the best. Next, page views. Page views are good at times, but it is only good if the users are achieving their objective while on site. But if there are so many pages to go through before they meet what they are looking for, then 
it is not convenient for the users. They probably left the website long ago. So maybe try not to keep the users need to click so many pages just for them to get into desired information. Keep in mind, be a user-friendly website and remember that users' times are precious. So I guess that is all from me about Hicks Law. Mm, thank you. Oh yeah, don't forget to try out the questions that we have prepared.